Hello dear students and welcome to this series of lectures in botany. Today we will be talking about bacteria structure. Before we talk about the structure of bacteria, let me tell you something what bacteria actually are. Bacteria are the most abundant and diversified group of single celled prokaryotic microorganisms on earth adapted for varied living conditions be it air, soil, water ranging from most ancient lineage of extreme thermophilic chemosynthetic autotrophs that reduce gaseous hydrogen and uh, sulfur to the lineage of photosynthetic autotrophs which are represented by the uh, cyanobacteria. Phylogenetic analyses of uh, this diversified group of microorganisms through molecular approaches reveal that 12 major lineages or kingdoms of bacteria do exist. And as I told you, this is a diverse world. If you take a pinch of soil in the palm of your hand, expectedly there are more than 10,000 different species of bacteria in it. And with all possible cultural combinations, we will not be able to culture more than 500 species of them approximately. For rest of the species, we have to devise the appropriate media and the environmental conditions. But Recent molecular approaches and uh, metagenomic analyses has allowed us getting a deep insight into the structural complexity as well as uh, community profiles of these cryptic microorganisms. So far the structure of bacteria is concerned, it has two principal components, the external or the morphological dimension and the internal dimension. Morphology includes size, shape, and uh, arrangement. So for their size is concerned, since they are microscopic in nature, they are very small, from 0 0.5 to 1 micrometer in diameter generally, due to which they have very high surface area to volume ratio. This is a very important thing. And this surface area to volume ratio being high compensates for their so many functions, which rest of the organelles such as mitochondria, chloroplast or other membrane bound organelles do in eukaryotes, keeping in view their small volume. And so far the shapes of the bacteria are concerned. They fall in three principal shapes. The rods, what we also call as bacilli. The spheres, what we also call as cocci. and spirals, what we sometimes refer also as spirulum type of the bacteria. And so for the arrangement is concerned, these rods or these spheres can either be uh, present singly or they can be paired. When they are paired, we call them as say diplococcus or diplobacillus. When they are uh, in chains, we call them as streptobacilli or streptococci. Likewise, they can be sometimes present in the form of grape-like structures or clusters when we call them as staphylo type of arrangement. The examples of these types are concerned. Rods also vary in shape and they can be slender, for example, in case of typhoid fever causing bacterium or they can be rectangular as in case of the anthrax causing agent or in some cases they are uh, club shaped for example, diphtheria bacteria. Likewise, streptobacilli so far are concerned, they are the chains of rods, as I told you. M uh, many rods in forming a chain. And uh, cocci so far are concerned, they can be diplococci when two spheres are uh, present as a pair, as we see in case of the bacteria that cause gonorrhea. And streptococci, when they are present in the form of the chains, uh, for example, those found in case of the intestines or involved in a particular disease of that strep throat. 
Then Sarsina type is a typical type of a bacterial you know, shape wherein we have a cube-like packet of eight cocci as we see in case of Micrococcus luteus. Then Staphylococcus, they are irregular grape-like clusters. The number of uh, spheres in them is not specific as we see in case of the Staphylococcus aureus. And there is again a term, related term, Staphylospirillum, when we have grape-like clusters of spirals. And then another principal shape of the bacteria, as I told you earlier also, is the Vibrio or the spiral bacteria, which may either be curved rods, as we see in case of the Vibrio cholerae, or they may be corkscrew shaped, for example, spiral cheats. So far the internal dimensions are concerned, or the cell structure of the bacteria is concerned. There are n number of components of this bacterial cell starting from, say, outside inwards, if we go, if bacteria are motile, they have flagella, the locomotory organs, they have the pili for attachment, then they have a layer of depositions uh, outside the cell wall in the form of the capsule, then there is a cell wall, inside the cell wall there is a plasma membrane, then uh, there are some other membrane-like structures, what we call as mesosomes, of course some people refer them as artifacts, then there are some specific uh, kind of things in, say, gram-positive bacteria only, not in the gram-negative bacteria as decolic acids. Then uh, lipopolysaccharides are an important component of their cell wall. Then there is a matrix of cytoplasm wherein we do not have the membrane-bound organelles, but we do have ribosomes of C70S type, then some inclusion bodies and some spores and so on and so forth. When we compare the structure with the eukaryotic cell, we do not find in them a well-developed nucleus. We do not find in prokaryotes or in bacteria the membrane-bound organelles. So, relatively speaking, it is a simpler cellular uh, level of organization. Well, let's talk about these bacterial structures or the components of uh, a bacterial cell one by one in some detail. First, let's talk in some detail about the flagella. As I told you, flagella are the appendages that help in motility of the bacteria or in movement of the bacteria from one place to the other. And about half of the all known bacteria are motile due to the presence of flagella. And these flagella vary in number as well as placement and their arrangement, let me tell you, is an important basis for bacterial classification. For example, when we have only one flagella at one end of the bacterium, we call it as monotrichus, as we see in case of the Pseudomonas originosa. When we have two flagella with one at each end, it is a condition what we call as amphitrichus type of distribution, as we see in case of the Equispirillum serpens. Third is the Lophotrichus, with, where we have tufts of flagella at one or both the ends of the bacteria, for example, Pseudomonas fluorescens. And another condition is Peritrichus, where we have flagella present all around the body, as we see in case of the Salmonella typhi. And uh, some bacteria which do not have any kind of the flagella, they are referred to as atrichus. Let me tell you, flagella is also present in some eukaryotes also. We have some uh, flagellated eukaryotes. But so far the prokaryotic flagellum is concerned, it is about one-tenth of the eukaryotic flagellum uh, in size and is about 10 to 20 micrometers in length. And this bacterial flagellum also differs from the eukaryotic flagellum in lacking typical microtubules with uh, 9 plus 2 arrangement and also a plasma membrane. It's not there. These bacterial flagella are composed of long, rigid strands of proteins, specific protein called as flagellin. 
which are arranged in the form of chains and wound around a triple helix with a hollow central core inside. And uh, each flagellum, in fact, is attached to a cell membrane by a basal region connecting uh, or consisting of uh, proteins other than flagellin. And a flagellum, if we divide it for the sake of convenience, has three uh, important parts. It has a basal body, which is associated with the cell membrane and the cell wall. But the basal body has an important role to play. Let me tell you here that the basal body consists of a central rod or a shaft surrounded by a set of rings, as we see in case of the machines or the drivers. Gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria differ here, let me tell you. And it's an important point that gram-negative bacteria have two pairs of rings one pair in the cell membrane and another in the cell wall. But gram-positive bacteria do have just one pair of rings. When flagella bundle together, they rotate counterclockwise and allow bacteria to basically run in a straight line. Then it has a, a hook that attaches the basal body with another part that is the helical filament. Related to flagella is a structure what we call as pili. Pili are hair-like structures which are composed again of a specific protein uh, or protein subunits called as pilin. And uh, they are hollow, non-helical, tiny filamentous appendages that are thinner, shorter, and more numerous than flagella. Let me tell you here that so for the functions of the pili are concerned, they are not involved in movement. Of course, they look like uh, flagella, but I, I told you they are shorter. But their function is to allow attachment of the bacterium to the other bacteria uh, and even to the other surfaces. And second important function is that they help the bacteria in conjugation for allowing the genetic material to pass on uh, from one bacterial cell to the other, uh, what we uh, specifically call as F pili or sex pili, the former which help in the attachment, we call them as uh, attachment pili, or fimbri also at times. This was about the flagella and the pili. Now let me tell you again here. Outside the cell wall, there is a deposition of several things. And we have certain terms that you see in books generally, uh, like capsule, slime layer, glycocalyx, to explain these things. So for the capsule is concerned, Acetic gelatinous and uh, protective layer is capsule, which is formed from the polysaccharides, different kinds of polysaccharides, and even polypeptides, or both, surrounding a cell wall. It's found only in certain bacteria, not in all the bacteria. For example, mostly it is found in bacilli and cocci, and not in the spiral uh, type of the bacteria. All inclusive term for all kinds of depositions uh, especially the polysaccharides containing different kinds of substances which are found external to the cell wall uh, from thinner slime layer to the thicker capsule and all inclusive term is glycocalyx and it is a currently acceptable term for all kinds of depositions surrounding the cell walls. Glycocalyx or the capsule slime layer complex has some important functions to play in case of the bacteria. The most important function is that it serves as a buffer between the cell and its external environment. The second important function is that it prevents the cell against drying and dehydration because it has high moisture content in it. The third important function is it helps bacteria to trap nutrients. And of course, it also protects nutrients basically to uh, flow away from the bacterial cell. Another important function is that it also facilitate disease establishment because, so for the encapsulated bacteria are concerned, they cannot be easily phagocytosed by the host defense mechanism. Now we come to the cell wall, a very, very important component of the bacterial cell. And in fact, it is the presence of the cell wall that is very important because this cell wall of course, it's present in all bacteria except mycoplasmas, which are also called as wall-less bacteria. The important and two principal functions, in fact, of the cell wall are, number one, that it determines the shape of the bacteria. Bacteria are able to have a particular type of a shape only because of this rigidity of the cell wall. Second important function is that it provides strength 
and prevents osmotic ruptures. These cell walls are generally made up of a typical kind of a polysaccharide, peptidoglycanes, which is a complex of, in fact, amino acids and the sugars. And it is unique to bacteria, so for the composition is concerned. Otherwise, we have cell walls in plants also, but composition is altogether different. And that's why bacteria were separated from the plants. And this peptidoglycane comprises about 20 to 40 percent of bacteria in general. Of course, there are differences in quantum of uh, peptidoglycan in gram positive and gram negative bacteria. The peptidoglycan polymer, what we also call as murine, is the single most important component of the bacterial cell wall, which is composed of alternating units of two amino containing carbohydrates or sugars, N acetyl glucosamine, and second is N acetyl muramic acid. Amino acids cross link the N acetyl glucosamine and N acetyl muramic acid. And the peptidoglycan occurs in, in fact, multiple layers connected by a side chain of four amino acids and forms a, you know, supporting net around the bacterium. However, let me tell you here that different bacteria can have different amino acids in the tetrapeptide chain as well as uh, have different cross links. But a principal distinction between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria is that in gram-positive bacteria, third amino acid is generally lysine, which in case of gram-negative bacteria is diaminopaminic acid. There is a clear-cut distinction between gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. If we discuss them point by point, uh, so for the important distinctions are concerned, in gram-positive bacteria, the peptidoglycan layer is very thick, but it is relatively thinner in case of gram-negative bacteria. Then we have a specific kind of substance, what we call as tecolic acid, which is in fact complex of glycerol, phosphates, and the rabitol, uh, which helps in the attachment of oils and so on. This tecolic acid is present only in case of gram-positive bacteria, but not in case of the gram-negative bacteria. Then we have an outer membrane. You know, generally outside the cell wall, we do not have a membrane, but in case of gram-negative bacteria, we do have a membrane. In case of gram-positive bacteria, we do not have a membrane. And as a result of that membrane, the periplasmic space is absent in case of gram-positive bacteria. Periplasmic space is the space between the cell wall and the cell membrane. There are some specific kinds of uh, polysaccharides, what we call as uh, lipopolysaccharides or LPS, also call them as endotoxins, present on the walls of especially gram-negative bacteria, which are composed of lipid A and a polysaccharide. And these endotoxins are sometimes also called as pyrogens because they, they are the causatives of the fe fever, general fever. Uh, because and their function, the function of these endotoxins is since they are toxic, they are too toxic and they kill mice, they kill pigs, humans or whatsoever, the other types of hosts. Well, having discussed this uh, cell wall structure, an important component that comes afterwards just inside the cell wall is the cell membrane. Cell membrane as a tool is an important component of bacterial cell, which is composed of lipid bilayer with some proteins, and it is a selectively permeable membrane. Of course, too flexible, but too dynamic. Generally, there are 60% uh, around proteins and 40% lipids. This, as I told you, is a dynamic and active membrane. Therefore, it regulates the movement of materials into and outside the bacterial cells. Then. Again, an important function of this cell membrane is that it serves as an anchor for the attachment of DNA during its replication in the bacteria. Significant kind of difference between phospholipids of eubacteria and archaebacteria. Let me tell you here, archaebacteria are those bacteria which generally live in extremely harsh conditions and we see that they represent the ancient lineage of the early evolving bacteria. In eubacteria, phospholipids and phosphoglycerides in which straight chain fatty acids are ester linked to glycerol. And in case of archaebacteria, the lipids are polyisoprenide branch chain lipids in which long chain branched alcohol or the phytanols are ether linked to glycerol. Then there is internal membrane system also in the bacteria, mesosomes, which represent the imaginations of the plasma membrane in the shape of uh, vesicles, tubules, and uh, lamellae, and so on. These are present in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, but more prominently they are found in the former than the later. 
few functions have been just attributed to them. They may be involved in cell wall formation during the cell division. Then second function is they may play a role in the chromosome replication and distribution due to daughter cells. The third attributed role to them is that they may be involved in some secretory processes. Next is the cytoplasm. Cytoplasm, as you know, in general, in case of rest of the cells also, it is a semi-fluid substance, usually comprised of 80% or more at times of water and 20% of rest of the things, including salts, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and so on. Phenomenon, what we call a cytoplasmic streaming, is generally present. But this cytoplasmic streaming is absent in case of prokaryotes or bacteria. And the mitochondria or uh, Golgi bodies or the other chloroplasts, the membrane-bound organelles are present in the cytoplasm, as we generally find in case of the eukaryotic cells. And ribosomes, of course, they are present in case of eukaryotic cells also, but they are of ATS type. In prokaryotes or in bacteria, ribosomes are of 70S type, and they are attached either to the plasma membrane or they are present in the matrix. There is a functional difference between the two. Since ribosomes are the protein factories, they are involved in the process of protein synthesis. Those which are attached to the membrane are involved in the synthesis of such proteins that are to be exported. Then there are inclusion bodies, uh, which refers to a variety of small bodies, including granules and vesicles and so on and so forth. There are specific kind of vesicles are called as gas vesicles, which are especially present in case of the aquatic bacteria that help them to have that buoyancy and floating action on the water. And so far the granules are concerned. They do contain very densely packed, compact substances which do not dissolve in cytoplasm. And each granule contains specific substances such as, say, glycogen, polyphosphate granules, which are for storage, then PHBs, polyhydroxybutyrate granules, which are for carbon storage. In addition to these things in bacterial cytoplasm, there are some specific kinds of proteins, what we call as chaperones or heat shock proteins. <laughs> Let's now talk about bacterial genome, which is also present in the cytoplasm. As you know, bacteria do not have a specific membrane around their nucleus or a nuclear membrane. They do not have a defined nucleus, but they have a nucleoid. And it is that nucleoid wherein we have bacterial DNA, as uh, in two locations it is generally found, in the circular chromosome which may be attached to the cell membrane or it may be present in the much smaller unattached circular plasmids. So for DNA is concerned, DNA is circular and it's haploid. And the advantages of this haploid or 1N DNA to 2N or diploid DNA are many. It's more efficient, it helps grow quicker, it allows mutations and adaptations to the environment quicker. The plasmids have a specific importance. Plasmids are the extracircular DNA and they are involved in the antibiotic resistance of these bacteria. At the last, let's have a word about endospores, which are specific kinds of spores formed under very harsh environmental conditions and they are very resistant to heat, radiation, cold and other kinds of stresses. Even if we boil these spores for one hour or so, they will be still viable in most of the cases. And it takes bacteria both time and energy to make these spores. Their location in bacteria is very important in their classification, whether they are central, they are subterminal, or they are terminal, and so on and so forth. And uh, these endospores are used for some specific purposes. For example, bacillus stereothermophilus spores. They are used for quality control of heat sterilization equipment. Likewise, bacillus anthracis spores are used in biological warfare. And they are so far their structural complexities are concerned. They vary in their shape, in size, in their forms, and in their arrangements, and so on. To conclude with, let me tell you that this diverse world of bacteria is structurally also very complex, and we have detailed so many structural components that are important in case of the bacteria. And I hope this might have given you a good insight of the understanding of the bacterial structure.
talk about the next things we will meet in the next lecture till then goodbye